when you came into the Ivy League, obviously there was an amount of time between Title IX being passed and when you joined the Ivy League, but what do you see as the biggest change or how did Title IX impact the Ivy League specifically? So I came to the Ivy League in 1984. Title IX had been passed a dozen years ago, a dozen years before. The, um, the regulation was probably was almost a decade old. And um, uh, I actually found two very interesting um, things. One was that um, uh, I think the, the educational issues uh, at the undergraduate level had been um, substantially uh, resolved. We were not yet 50-50 in terms of undergraduate enrollment, but it was very clear that once we took the barriers away and began to admit uh, men and women on an equal basis, that we were going to have um, student bodies that were very heavily um, female, that they would uh, pretty quickly approach 50 percent. And I think those issues were, were substantially done. The faculty issues continued to linger, especially um, in schools which prided themselves on hiring the very best faculty worldwide. Um, and uh, um, I don't know that we were any slower than other faculties in, in truly reaching out uh, to women and, and to faculty of color for that matter. Um, but I don't know that we were any faster either. And I think um, uh, that continues to be a place where Ivy schools uh, try to be leaders and it continues to be a place where um, Ivy schools continue to receive a great deal of attention, which is in making sure that um, our faculties truly are integrated. Um, what of course I've noticed since then is that um, um, leadership in Ivy positions and uh, faculty and administrative positions in Ivy schools um, is now really um, very open and well distributed um, and I think the, the the tenor of, of schools nationally and the tenor of Ivy schools in terms of faculty employment is, is very much different now uh, than, than it was when I started. Um, so academically I think we were, um, um, if, if not in the 80s when, when things were still really beginning, I think we became leaders very quickly and I think we've remained leaders um, in, in many ways. Um, athletically we were also leaders in the early 80s because um, as we began to admit um, women, um, we began to add athletics. And um, we certainly had um, issues in which particular schools or particular sports um, were slow in some reasons, uh, in some ways, but because we had the endowment income to be able to begin athletic programs, um, and because we had very well established and broad-based men's programs, we had both the incentive and the capacity to begin women's athletics uh, fairly early. If you had 15 or 16 or 17 men's teams, it was hard not to begin women's athletics um, uh, pretty rapidly. And, and we did begin women's athletics rapidly. We had um, many of the early leaders in the AIAW, which was the governing body for women's athletics before the NCA began to be willing to offer women's athletics, were Ivy women administrators. Um, Ivy schools moved relatively quickly to promote and give some responsibility to Ivy women administrators. And um, we developed competition in uh, most, if not all, the sports that we have now fairly early um, in uh, the athletic history. So that by the time I got here in the 80s, um, we were playing uh, women's athletics, I think, in every sport in which we now compete. Um, and soon after that, Columbia moved from Division Three to Division One, so we were all um, competing at, at the highest NCAA level. And um, because we had facilities and coaches, we began to be um, successful in many ways. So I think we have maybe the oldest and deepest history of any league in the country in terms of women's athletics. And what do you think Title IX's biggest impact was on college athletics as a whole? Well, uh, th there may be three or four. I think um, uh, one was that, um, although I think the educational barriers in America might have broken slowly without Title IX, I'm not convinced that girls and women's athletics would have grown in the way it has um, without Title IX. And, and one reason for that is that the tremendous growth in revenue over the last 20 years in, in football and, and men's basketball, um, uh, I don't know that that revenue would have been uh, distributed um, to other sports, especially women's sports, uh, as much as it has been without uh, the legislative requirement and the regulatory requirement of uh, Title IX, and um, I don't know that um, 
uh, individual schools would have moved nearly as quickly as they have in many instances without the, the, the possibility of Title IX legislation um, uh, as a, a, a kind of a fallback. You, 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 there was no point in, in, in waiting too long if you knew that you could be sued, and, pe and people were sued, and, and we had some litigation within the Ivy League. So I think Title IX in the Ivy League as it was elsewhere was, was essential to the growth of uh, women's athletics uh, throughout higher education. And um, uh, I guess the secondary effect is that the fact that Title IX did change women's education and did eliminate barriers outside um, uh, athletics meant that campuses had more and more women, uh, more representation of women in governance and faculty positions, more and more women students, and so the constituency for change in athletics was created uh, um, by Title IX, and even without the requirement in athletics as such, the fact that um, the nature of our institutions changed and that we had uh, women on campus who wanted uh, every opportunity, including the athletic opportunity, was a fundamental uh, change under Title IX.